Will you join me in prayer? Almighty Father, as we come before you on this Sabbath day, a post-feast Sabbath, we're so grateful for what we enjoyed these last few weeks for the fellowship and for the services and for the blessings of coming before you and seeing your face. We're so grateful that we could renew our spirit. And we pray that you will be with those who came out, who sought you through that feast, through the feast, that your guidance would be theirs and that your spirit would invigorate them even more to follow you. We thank you for this day. We ask for a special blessing on those that have a special need because of sickness. We know a number are suffering right now, so if you would be our Yahweh Rapha and, and answer our prayer for them. And this prayer also includes the desire to this day be an inspiration for many, that your words would come through and that we would all be thankful for your word, for your understanding as we seek you in these final days. In Yasha's name we pray. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Well, here we are basking in the afterglow of a very inspiring Feast of Tabernacles. We uh, entertained pretty much maxed out this whole facility, and I wondered how much more can we go? Uh, first of all, as you all know, we got to expand our parking. That's uh, that was a big issue. Um, we can always find a place to sit to eat, maybe downstairs or something. But it's hard to find parking when you're built on a hill. So we're going to have to do something in the coming weeks. But uh, we'll do it. We already have it in the plans to add some more. As we learn by observing them, Yahweh's appointed times are anything but ancient dead ritual. His days are alive and up to the moment. His days unlock the true way to salvation. If only we'd understand them and observe them. And they show us Yahweh's plan prophetically, foreshadowing the inauguration of his very kingdom on earth, coming soon. How much more important can you get? As we showed recently, the Bible is revealed on many different levels. We find it revealed in prophecy. We find it revealed in levels of histor historical significance, symbolically, philologically, and spiritually, and many other ways I can't even think of. The Bible is built on layers. As we go from one layer to another, we grow spiritually. So the idea is to advance from one la layer to another, one level to another, to learn more about Yahweh and his mind and his will. And that's what we want anyway, to know his will. Our worship must be centered on him and not us, as we so much we see today. Uh, we have to please Yahweh, not gratify the worshiper. That's not what it's all about. Get the worshiper what he wants, not what the Father wants. Worship today is mostly market-driven. All the techniques of marketing are used to get people to warm a pew. And it centers on the people and not Yahweh. And that means the entire collection of biblical standards, which all center on Yahweh, are filtered through so much that all you got left is fluff. Fluff. The narrow way is broadened, and there isn't much left but to think of non-confrontational thoughts, making it easy, making the way light. But the Bible says the way of truth is narrow. It's a narrow way. It's a narrow gate and a narrow way. you got to squeeze into it. It's not easy. It's not just walking straight on through, no, no worries, no problems. But the narrow way is an overstatement. There's a reason Paul said to fight the good fight, that the time would come when they would not endure sound teachings. I think we're there. I think we're at that time now in this day. That time is today. So how to go forward? We get a lot of direction from history and examples in scripture. You know, a fundamental key to grasping the Bible, Yahweh's word, is to understand the rich use of analogies 
and types. For instance, Father Abraham is a type of Father Yahweh. Adam is a type of Yahshua. Moses, a kind of Yahshua. If you look at their lives and what they went through and how they reflect some other person, some other uh, Yahweh or Yahshua. Egypt equates to sin. The promised land, a type of the kingdom. Israel, a model of the called out worshipers seeking an inheritance in a promised land. It's all there. Man, talk about a design. Talk about a book that's so complex. Each time you open it up, you find something new. There's no end to what you can learn. And I've only scratched the surface. One of the unsung heroes of scripture um, that we find in scripture, and let's see if I... Well, I guess that's not working. I have a title to this talk if we can ever get it on screen, but uh, one of the unsung heroes of scripture on the, it is there. It's not on my screen though. We gotta do something about that. I remember shutting it off last week and apparently it's still on. Sorry about that. But one of the unsung heroes of scripture and the epitome of righteousness himself is a man whose name we know better than any other but Yahweh. His name is the same as our Savior's name, Yahshua. The sanctified elect who will be chosen to rule and reign in the coming kingdom are represented by the man named Joshua. Yahshua, son of Nun. His name means Yahweh is salvation, as we know. The man led Israel over the Jordan into the promised land, and we all remember the story about fighting the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. I think the walls just sank down into the ground so they could run across and attack the city and not stumble over huge blocks of stone. But anyway, that's my own idea. But he did one battle after another to take over the promised land from the Canaanites. He's a man that has unparalleled qualities. And this is why he was relied on to lead the army. Today I want to look at this extraordinary individual and what his life tells us about our own walk of truth. He overcame many obstacles. He went against the status quo. He went against the thinking of the, the people. He went against their weaknesses. He didn't give in to the gainsayers, the negative Nellies, the doubting Thomases. We recall the account Moses leads Israel out of Egypt the express purpose for this exodus announced to Pharaoh by Yahweh himself is to take his people into the wilderness to keep a feast to him, a feast. So when you go into the feast, you are coming out of the world and learning the truths of his people. Keep a feast in the wilderness, Exodus 3.18. In Exodus 15, we read, verse 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the uh, wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah, which means bitter. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? This is the first complaint, major complaint of the people. What are we going to drink, Moses? First, they were thirsty. Then they were hungry. Then they complained about the fear they had of the Canaanites. Then they questioned Moses' authority. Then they accused Moses of killing certain Israelites when it was Yahweh who did it, not Moses. But Yahweh supernaturally judged them because he was fed up with it. Do you get the feeling that Israel's favorite pastime was belly aching? Is that ours too? I hope not. That their problem was a lack of faith. If you had been among the two plus million people that came out of Egypt, what would you have done? Would you also have jumped aboard this train? I'm unhappy here. I don't like it here. This is hot. And we know about that. Had a feast that was uh, rather tepid, but we, we enjoyed it anyway. How different are we really? We had a visitor to Tabernacles years ago who complained that 
There wasn't a free meal three times a day. I never heard a complaint like that this year. If they did, they were out to lunch, I mean, literally, because it was great. We had plenty to eat, and everybody seemed to enjoy it. Romans 14, 17, Paul says, The kingdom of Yahweh is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy. Some people are all about food, and if they don't have food, they complain. We have not learned the lessons, apparently, of Israel. I hope that we never secretly wish that we didn't have to take a stand for the Sabbath, for the feast days. We can be just like the world, just breeze on by. Well, we think they're breezing on by, but they're suffering too. They have their own problems. But Yahweh gets us through all of our issues. We came back from the feast and everything went kitty wampus. I don't know if you're aware of it. Electronically, everything went down, it seems. Not only do we have the AC problem, but our TriCaster, which really governs everything we do here as far as recording and sending out uh, whatever, it went down and it, it you know, takes care of all our electronics. And then our, our Drobo, our, our mass storage unit went down. We couldn't even get to our files. Uh, then we had computers going down and mine was one of them. And then the network seemed to be going down. This was, this was like, okay, Satan, we made it through, but you can cool it now. But we had a savior, <laughs> Yasha the Messiah, who, through Sister Michaela and Chris, amazingly got it all back up and running again. It was, I'm, I'm astounded how she can, she was, give her a thank you when you see her sometime. But, uh, she, not only can she sing, but she can figure things out like I've never seen. Anyway, I hope that we never secretly wish that we didn't, you know, need to take a stand when we make a commitment to Yahweh because it's all, that's what it's all about, making a commitment to Yahweh. And we should enjoy doing that and teaching the world all about making a commitment to Yahweh. But not like those in Israel who had nothing past complaining. They couldn't see beyond. Young people, do you ever wish you could participate in sports and other school activities on the Sabbath? Friday nights, big one. You ever wish you could play? But you know, you can make a stand and you can teach by it. I have two grandsons who uh, love baseball. They made it all the way to the state all-stars, but they told them they can't play Friday nights or Saturday. So the president of Little League found out that they had you know, this stand and uh, he switched their schedule so that they could play on non-Sabbath times. And then he made the comment, I wish everybody was as committed as they are to their faith. See, you can teach people stuff like this when you make a stand. You can teach people. And they're going to remember that. This guy is going to remember it the rest of his life. And the people, too, that uh, heard it. What about making a stand for, with relatives and, and friends when they have a big bash in the summer on, on Sabbath? You just go along with it? Or you say... Uh, Sorry, I won't be able to make it. That's the Sabbath day. I focus on Yahweh. How much easier is it to be like everyone else in Canaan? Trade off salvation for the sake of the world. That was Israel. Israel wished they could go back to Egypt. Forget this wilderness stuff, Moses. We've had enough of it now. Let's go back. You can have it. I hate living the life of a nomad, wandering in the wilderness. I want my house back, my Keurig, and my lazy boy. And I don't like all this wilderness stuff. It's hot. I can't have anything to eat and nothing to drink. Moses, turn it around. We want to go back. I'm miserable. I'm deprived. All about me. Moses, give me Egypt or give me death. And they came very close to the latter, I'll tell you. Yahweh's going to wipe them all out. Yahweh is testing you too. Are you willing to give up the offerings of this world to be obedient to him? What about giving back 10% of your increase? He expects it, you know. In truth, the tithe isn't ours to keep anyway. He says, they're mine. It's mine. Everything he has is his. He just wants a little bit back to show your devotion to him. If we keep it, we're, we're guilty dead to rights of robbing Yahweh, according to Malachi 3.8. We have to be able to, as he told the rich young man, we have to be able to give it all up. He couldn't do that. And no doubt, 
To walk away from everything we have, one day that will be a test for us. I, I almost guarantee it. Are we willing to do that? To reconnect with Yahweh. Of all our shortcomings, their shortcomings, Israel's biggest crisis was the same common today. They didn't trust Yahweh. They didn't trust him. They didn't trust him to bless them. They didn't trust him to protect them. They didn't trust him to keep his promises. They trusted in themselves. Most didn't put him first in their lives and don't believe him enough to obey him. He even challenges us, prove me now herewith and see if I won't pour out the blessings. Prove me, prove me. Besides that, Israel had no memory cells in their brains. They forgot the miracles Yahweh performed a week ago. They lost faith. When they grumbled against Moses, they were actually griping to Yahweh. Paul warns about that. 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Neither murmur you as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. I didn't hear too much murmuring at this feast. This was, this was primo when it came to people really coming here out of their hearts to serve Yahweh. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. You probably noticed it too. I mean, all this pessimism and complaining, we see a ray of light. We see some hope come through. Guess what? Joshua is here. Joshua is here. Joshua is here. The Israelite, remarkable man, a saint of saints, unmovable in his convictions, as all the great men of Yahweh were, unmovable. Ranking at the top of the list of the faithful, totally trusting of Yahweh. Let's see what we can learn from this man. Maybe his example will convince us to be truer followers of Yahweh. Of all the adults who came out of Egypt for the promised land of Canaan, only he and Caleb made it there. Not even Moses, not even his older brother Aaron were allowed into the promised land. They were barred, Numbers 20, 12. But this honor of entry was given to a faithful man of Joshua and Caleb because of their faith, because they were not chronic complainers, because they had faith in Yahweh. We're introduced to this remarkable man in Exodus 17. The qualities we in Israel could use much more of are faith and patience. You know, Yahweh has so much more patience. You ever notice that? We, Come on, come on, come on. We, we pray and we pray and we want something to happen and and nothing seems to happen, all of a sudden, boom. Yahweh is testing us at those times. Are we going to be faithful? Are we going to wait on him? He has a lot more patience than we do. If Israel had more faith, they would have had more patience. Same for us. At times, we may complain that nothing is happening. He isn't answering our prayers. Well, maybe, maybe there's one of three answers. Maybe the answer is no. Maybe the answer is not yet. Maybe the answer is wait. I'm sure we can all attest to that often in our lives. His timetable teaches us faith and patience. And we're no different from the impatient Israelites in many ways. A problem with impatience reveals a problem with faithfulness. We're not willing to wait. We're not willing to expect Yahweh to answer. We want it now. We want to get, get the answer now. Exodus 17, 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men, go out and fight with Amalek. As soon as we start to complain, here comes the enemy. And we're most vulnerable when we're off balance, discouraged, and fearful and dismayed. So Moses picks out Joshua and commands him to assemble a fighting force at once. He responded to the call with no delay. No excuse. I mean, they had to go to war tomorrow. Can you imagine getting the fighting men all together? Because they're going to war tomorrow with this, this uh, powerful enemy. No excuses, no arguments, no complaining. It's an important attribute of, of this remarkable man. His faith was so strong, he had nothing to fear. He didn't fear going against these people. 
Because he had Yahweh behind him. He knew it. Entering Canaan, he kept reciting the good points of Canaan, remember? When the 12 went in, only he and Caleb had good things to say. We can take it. Oh, these are giants out there, the 10 said. Oh, they're, they're, they're giants. Well, you can't fight these people. I mean, they're huge. Whether it was actually huge or huge in their mind, you know, how we, we embellish things when we don't want to do something. Oh, we can't do it. That's a terrible. You know what's going to happen if we do that. And, of course, usually it never happens. But that's what they were worried about. Joshua and Caleb says, it's a land of milk and honey. Come on. Let's take it. We got Yahweh behind us. So, Exodus 17.10, Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. You remember the story. When Moses held up his arms, they were in defeat of Amalek. When his arms dropped, they started to be defeated by Amalek. So they put stones under his arms, and they held up her and uh, Aaron and her held up his hands, one on one side and the other, until the going down of the sun. And while he was, they were holding him up, they were victorious against the Amalekites. Joshua discomfited them, it says in verse 13, which means overthrew or wasted them. Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And Yahweh said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. We have it right here, Joshua. There it is, in a book. Write it in a book. This is important. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And, and then Moses built an altar and called the name of it Yahweh Nisi, Yahweh our banner. For he said, because Yahweh has sworn that Yahweh will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Joshua was a man completely obedient to the call, trusting Yahweh. Whatever Yahweh would ask, he'd do it without fear, without hesitation, with no complaints. The enemy, Amalek, came from Israel's distant past. He was, he was the grandson of Jacob's twin brother, Esau. He separated from his brethren, and Balaam called him the first of nations to fight Israel, Numbers 24-20. So he was a relative of Jacob. Israel. He was a relative of Israel. Amalek is a type of our old nature that, that was part of us, our old nature that we came past, that we got rid of when we came to follow in the footsteps of Yahshua. And it rears its ugly head whenever in a state of crisis, sometimes it wars with us, with Yahweh, our old nature. We have to keep putting it down, putting it down. That's the flesh. The spirit of Amalek causes us to say things of which we hadn't said, to do things which we later wish we hadn't done. We rethink. It gives us doubts. It tries to destroy our faith. It hits us in the blind side. Amalek is a tool of the adversary. Let's, let's just face it. It's a tool of the adversary. From this first great victory of Joshua, Yahweh gives us some great lessons. First, we can't indulge in self-pity. How can we face him, Moses? How can we do it? We don't really have an army. We just kind of have a bunch of guys with, you know, they got to get their swords and see if they can defeat him. We don't dispute a dilemma with him or challenge his ability to care for us or question his management of our affairs when we put it in his hands. Put it in his hands and go with it. Have faith in him. Don't look for someone to blame, someone to blame for your problems. Don't look for a scapegoat. Joshua didn't do, Joshua didn't do like the rest of Israel saying, Moses, 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 now look what you did. Now look what you've done. Amalek is going to destroy us. How do you expect me to go out and defeat his army? How would you put up with Israel? Constant, constant, constant. What about poor Moses always getting the full monte of Israel's discontent? How much can one person take? I think about today in politics, how much can a person take? Not much has changed. We'll have dark days, but you know, just wait for a better day. They always come. But they at times are Yahweh's design and 
We need to trust in him. They're tests. They're tests because, we're, as we said before, we are, if we're the first fruits, we're undergoing tests now. This is our judgment. This is our judgment now because when Yahshua comes back, if you've been judged worthy, he'll take you into his kingdom because of what we're doing now. We're judged by what we do now. We're judged by what, how we act, how, we, how our faith is, and how we uh, worship Yahweh, how we carry on our lives now. What we do and how we're rewarded is what we do in this life. So when we have trials, it's just part of judgment we have to overcome. He's to see what, we're, what kind of stuff we're made of. Do we have what it takes to be in his kingdom, to serve him? He's not going to take the you know, the, the, the doubter. He's not going to take the wishy-washy. He's not going to take the guy who turns his back at any little problem. He's going to take those who are strong in the faith, who will not give up. That's, he doesn't want anybody else in his kingdom. Think about it. He can bring a blessing even from a desert wasteland, a stream of water from a rock, quail, like a sea of birds everywhere to eat. Manna. Every morning, go out and pick up manna. This this uh, honey honey like tasting bread stuff really certainly would be good. Every morning, go out and just pick it up off the ground. The third lesson we learn is we will have to battle our old nature, our selfish, carnal selves that will produce doubt and fear. If we lose our faith in Yahweh, Moses lowering his arms in the battle was like losing the confidence and trust that we humans often lose. Fourth, whatever we find Yahweh's word tells us to do, we do it at once. No excuses, no apologies. Like the man who said at my first feast, if that's what the Bible says, that's what I'm going to do. Plain and simple. He wasn't going to argue it. Wouldn't try to get out of it. He says, that's what it says. That's what I'm going to do. Yahweh called Moses to a thunderous, craggy mountain called Sinai to speak to him. In one of his journeys up the mountain, Moses chose Joshua out of the millions of Israelites down there. He, he wanted a companion to go with him. He chose Joshua. Partway up the mountain, they disappeared in the swirling clouds and smoke. Israel, in the meantime, down in the mountain, and waited a couple days, started to lose faith at the bottom of the mountain. For 40 days and nights, no sign of these men. Where'd they go? What were they doing? Did they die? Did Yahweh kill them? What happened to these guys? Only a thundering, smoldering mountain was left of the sight of the people. Celestial lightning revealing Yahweh's presence, but did they had the faith that he would deliver. So while Moses was in close communication with Yahweh, Joshua was waiting there faithfully to see what was going to happen. Alone on the mountain, it was a measure of the man's great spiritual strength that he did not despair or panic or run back down the mountain to join Israel, not knowing what had happened to Moses himself, probably. I'm sure Moses said, oh, I'm going to go up now, I'm going to go this way to commune with Yahweh. You just stay here and, and keep watch. Hungry, thirsty, 40 days of fasting and patient waiting, not giving in to his own desires to join his people. You know, 40 is the number of testing. And in this process, Joshua was being tested. Israel was being tested too, down at the base of that mountain. They were being tested. Would they have faith to wait on Yahweh? He had nothing but his own quiet confidence in Yahweh to sustain him. And he remained totally faithful the whole time. Like a patient son, like Yahshua, Yahweh's own son, who was 40 days on his own mountain being tested by Hasatan right after his immersion. You know, in these quiet interludes, will we remain faithful on the mountain when doubt starts to overtake us? Will we hang in there when doubts arise? being alone, to question our faith, to wonder, what am, I, what am I doing? Am I going to be faithful? Can I continue on this walk? When there's no one around to fellowship with, there's people out there who 
Sabbath after Sabbath, I have nobody. And I know what that's like because I was there early on. We didn't have anybody either. But we kept our nose in the scriptures. We did what we could. We didn't have online Sabbath services either. We had nothing. But thankfully, um, in my family, we were going to keep on being true to Yahweh. It's lonely not being able to talk about your faith. You know, I get great encouragement when I read letters from prisoners who say, no one else in this entire prison believes like I do. And then they go on to encourage us. What is the caliber of our character? Can we remain strong and faithful during times of distress, times of trial, times of dismay? Will we remain faithful? We're apart from our friends and associates and families. Even when it seems we've been forgotten, will we remain faithful? Well, Joshua could. His fellow Israelites camped at the base of the mountain could not. They couldn't wait to be welcoming again to Moses and Joshua. They went on their own way. After waiting a while, they gave up. Some catastrophe, catastrophe must have befallen Moses and Joshua. They're no longer around. No faith in Yahweh, who called Moses up in the first place. Can we trust Yahweh to be with his people, come what may? When that tornado threatened Holt Summit, I talk about this a lot. I keep thinking, I kept thinking, um, would Yahweh harm this place and his people? Would he do that? The ones preaching his truth, would he actually do that? Nah, he wouldn't do it. Why would he? I mean, it's like cutting off your own, you know, your own hand. Why would he do that? Why would he harm his people in this work? Let's make a substitute deity to worship, says Israel, something of our own we can see and touch. A mighty one that has no demands on us. We can make it be whatever we want our worship to be. Hey, that's it. Let's worship ourselves. No Sabbath to keep, no clean foods to eat, no feast to observe, no sin to worry about. This deity accepts what we want, the best of both worlds. Except there's no blessing in it. Except it's not even real. This golden calf symbolizes our own worship. Aaron, the high priest, was responsible for right worship, and he blew it. Oh, I threw this, you know, this gold into the fire, and out came this calf. But it says he, he engraved it. And then it says, when he looked at it, he says, oh, I'll put an altar up before it. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. He had, uh, he had nothing to do with it. Break off the golden earrings, he said, which are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings and were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, these be your mighty ones, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Amazing. They couldn't even trust the high priest for faithfulness. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and Aaron made proclamation and says, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. And this calf is supposed to represent Yahweh, I guess. And they rose up early on the morning, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, rose up to play. And Yahweh said to Moses, get down there, for your people that you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. They have made a molten calf and have worshipped it, Bro breaking the number one commandment. The first commandment, have no other mighty ones before me, and they immediately broke it. The most important commandment of all. It's a stiff-necked people, he says. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot and may consume them, and I'll make of you a great nation. And Moses, don't do it. Hold on. Now, I don't know. You know, you often wonder, you, did Yahweh really mean it? Did he just express it to make a point, you know, to get his... Uh, get Moses' attention. I don't know. Uh, he was at the point where I think he was ready to do it. He was ready to start over with Moses. And Moses said, don't do it, don't do it. Uh, they'll just say you brought us out here to kill us. 
And Yahweh repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Um, Yahweh didn't sin. He just rethought, I guess. Or maybe he, uh, he said, okay. Okay, Moses, I'll listen to you. Israel had been redeemed from the sins of Egypt, saved from oppressive bondage to a great pagan worldly system. And now like a dog returning to vomit, they betrayed Yahweh's trust, made their own mighty one, says, you know, because in Egypt, that's what they worshiped, the uh, bull deity, made a, their own mighty one like they saw in Egypt. Isn't that amazing how we return to the things we learned earlier, if we're not careful? All the, the traditions that become important, again, if we're not careful. We've got to make sure we make a break. Just follow Yahweh. Forget man's traditions. We saw the movie at the feast, Fiddler on the Roof. Tevye would rely on, and this was uh, the Jewish traditions, but he kept saying traditions, traditions, and they want to break and go the opposite way. Kind of how many people are. They can't break from those traditions. When Moses finally saw it for himself, he threw down the tables of the law on the rocky slopes, showing that every one of those commandments was now broken by Israel. He challenges Aaron and was enraged by all excuses he heard. The people made me do it. I threw it in the fire and out came this idol. In only 40 days represents a time of trial and testing. Israel had completely reversed course, corrupted themselves. They were the disaster. Immediately, Moses challenged all the people in Exodus 32, 26. But let's back up a minute. Joshua reported to Moses the rebellion in Israelite camp while they were still on the mountain. He says, there's a sound of war going on down there. Something, something bad's going on down there. Uh, he was not the kind to uh, want a piece of the action. He was not the kind who wanted to take over Moses responsibilities or Moses position he was a faithful wingman for Moses he didn't want to be equal with Moses to make the decisions he was meek modest unassuming content to be an aide and he demonstrated his faithfulness over and over and over in somewhat lesser ways faithful in small things he'd be chosen by Yahweh for great leadership once Moses was denied entrance into the promised land Yahweh took Joshua to go in. He took Joshua to lead them in. This was the man who would soon become the leader of Israel, a prototype of Yahshua, the Messiah, leading us into the kingdom. Along with Caleb, he stood against the ten. He defeated the fortified city of Jericho with Yahweh's power. The Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, 31 kings he defeated, this man Joshua. He never looked for excuses. He had full patience and faith in Yahweh. He was a saint. He was chosen to be Moses' successor. He was filled with Yahweh's spirit of wisdom, Deuteronomy 34, 9. He enjoyed the presence of Yahweh, Judges 1, or Joshua 1, 5. He had extraordinary faith. He was ever obedient, Numbers 32, 12. You know, one of the most moving of passages in the scriptures is what we find in Joshua 24, the last chapter. It was a covenant made with Israel and ratified just prior to Joshua's death. I'm going to read it here, um, verse 13. And I have given you a land which... You did not labor, and cities which you built not. What does this say about us and the kingdom? Think about it. And you dwell in them of the vineyards and the olive yards, which you uh, planted not, nor did you eat. Now, therefore, fear Yahweh, he says, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Remember, this is, this is Joshua basically on his deathbed. He's telling Israel, this is my last, 
my last warning, my last words to you. Put away the mighty ones which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye Yahweh. And if it seem evil <laughs> unto you to serve Yahweh, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Whether the mighty ones which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the mighty ones of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. The people answered and said, far be it that we should forsake Yahweh to serve other mighty ones. And guess what they did? <laughs> forsook Yahweh. How many times to serve other mighty ones? You know, when you make a commitment, you keep it. When you make a commitment to Yahweh, that's it. You've made a commitment to Yahweh. This man says, just prior to his death, you can do what you want, but that's on you. That'll be on you. Me and my family, I'm the one I got to answer to, to Yahweh. I'll do Yahweh's will. And we can see the work of the adversary all the way through this, trying to overthrow faith, trying to divide. Who do you think Satan's going to work on the most in these final days? Those who worship in darkness or those that are closer to becoming Yahweh's faithful in the kingdom? Who's he going to work hardest on? On Yahweh's people who have the truth, the prize, the future members of his family? He's going to work on destroying your relationship with Yahweh. Satan is the accuser of our brethren. He's a master at rebellion. He knows you very well. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your strengths. And he'll work on your weaknesses big time. Knowledge is power, and Satan has immense knowledge. He has seen and remembers all of our characteristics. What are your weaknesses? Can you overcome them? Do you overcome them? Satan will use that, whatever it is, whatever you do that defies Yahweh, he's going to work on. He's going to use it. He attacks us when we're weak spiritually, through lack of prayer, lack of Bible study, when we only come occasionally to his presence, when we get overly concerned over little things, the Marthas. You know, here's Joshua sitting there with her sister, having uh, communion, communion with them, and Martha's worried about a crooked tablecloth. Come on, Martha. What's going on here? Well, we can't blame her so much because in some ways we're just as nutty and we don't see the big picture. We don't see the importance of Yahweh and his, his word. So we gossip. We have selfish ambitions. We lose our focus on what really matters. Uncontrolled emotions. Are we always upset about something? Desire to manipulate, control. Loss of spiritual fervency. I mean, it goes on and on. Lusts of the flesh. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9 says we must be ever so vigilant. Be watchful. We know there's a roaring lion around there just ready to snap at us. We're tried by the same thing the world is tried with. Only I think it's harder. I think he works on us harder. So may we all have the faith of Joshua to trust in Yahweh and not in our own will and in our own ways and our own mind and trying to get through. Go to Yahweh first. You know, there's a sister in the faith who says, sometimes I get just overload with problems. I can't handle it. I just can't deal with it all. So what I do is I put it in a box and I say, here, Yahweh, take care of it for me, and then I forget it. And guess what? It works. He takes care of it. Sometimes we worry that we have to work everything out ourselves. Sometimes we can't. So we leave it up to him. I hope we can all learn lessons from Joshua, a man with pure faith. Hallelujah. Yeah, thank you, Elder Allen, for that message. Compliance and complaints, Joshua's story. Well, brethren, we have again our baptismal service today. So I'm going to go ahead and call forward Elder Randy, and we'll move on with that as witnesses.
Hallelujah. Well, we are certainly blessed today to uh, have someone that's come all the way from New York, Long Island, New York, to uh, seek immersion into Yahshua's name, and that is always such a blessing. I want to review baptism for just a few moments. I'm not going to belabor the point because I think most of us understand this. But uh, just a review, so Romans 6 is one of my favorite passages speaking about baptism. Romans 6, uh, 3 through uh, 5, it says, uh, Know ye not that so many of us, as were immersed, were baptized into Yahshua's Messiah, were baptized into his death. So, you know, I've, I've, brought, the, I've brought this out many, multiple times historically. Baptism represents a death. It represents Yahshua's death. And uh, verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, the like as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And the phrase in the Greek, newness of life, simply means a new way of living, a new life. And I uh, generally uh, explain this during the baptismal counseling, that when we um, walk in a newness of life or when we repent, uh, literally in the Greek that is to think differently, to, to actually uh, live differently, to behave differently. And I think that's what it means there, Paul speaking about newness of life, not walking in the ways we walked prior to, our conversion, but walking differently, walking according to Yahweh's ways afterwards. Now, verse 5 really has a lot of meaning for me, and it says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so again, just as Yahshua died, we too die at baptism. goes on to say, We shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So, you know, I normally point out that baptism has multiple meanings. Acts 2, verse 38, we're not going to read that today, but we know that it begins by saying repent. And, of course, again, repentance is a turning away to think differently, to behave differently. And then it says to be baptized. Of course, that's an overwhelm of immersion. It comes from the Greek baptizo. And then it says you should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, again, this is another gift. So we find remission of sins through the baptism and also the, through the laying of hands. We find the gift of the Holy Spirit. But here in Romans 6, we see that there's another element to baptism, and that is when we're immersed in Yahshua's name, we also rise as new creatures, and as such, we will also partake in the likeness of Yahshua's resurrection. And that's such an important point that a lot of people miss. You know, some people say baptism is not necessary. Of course it's necessary, especially if we want to be resurrected in Yash as Yahshua was resurrected. So that is an important truth that we need to understand that we die to him, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, we receive remission of sins, and at his coming, we will also, in, in the likeness of his resurrection, be resurrected at his return. Or John 3, this is a passage I normally don't review, but it's very relevant to baptism. You know, some people again ask, is baptism necessary? Is, some, is this something we should be doing? There's many people out there that believe baptism is, uh, is not necessary, and of course we believe very different here. Uh, John 3, starting in verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees, you know, not all Pharisees were bad, by the way. We see evidence of that here. Nicodemus was a good guy. And yet he identified himself as a Pharisee. Not all Pharisees were bad people. So the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, verse 2 says, same came to Yahshua by night, where he was afraid because, again, he, he was a Pharisee and did not want to fall out of favor with the Pharisees. So he came at night and said unto him, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from Elohim, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except Elohim be with him. So he recognized Nicodemus that this was indeed the uh, power of Almighty Yahweh, what he was uh, able to accomplish. And Yahshua says, answered and said, And unto him, verily, verily, I send to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of, of Yahweh. So the question is, how are we born again? Now, some people believe that born again completely occurs at baptism. We actually believe that being born again is a process. We believe that being born again be, begins at immersion, of course, we are born, it says, of the water and of the Spirit, so the water there represents baptism. But the Spirit there, we believe, represents the actual resurrection. So again, it's a process. We are born again, but that born again process begins at baptism. And then it is finalized, if you will, at the resurrection. Now, we see, a, I believe, a counter-reference to this, or secondary reference in second, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and uh, verse 50, it says, this is Paul speaking. By the way, this is a reference really to the uh, first resurrection, speaking about how we're going to be changed. Yahshua's coming, how we're going to, you know, we were sown in weakness, for instance. It says we're going to be rise in power and strength and 
and uh, that sort of thing. But in verse uh, 50, it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Or this is very similar to what we find from Yahshua's statement in John chapter 3. John, again, John chapter 3, Yahshua says that we must be born again, and it says that we must be born of the water and of the spirit. For according to Paul, flesh and blood cannot receive Yahweh's kingdom. So you see, the spirit there is a resurrection when we are changed, because we know that when Yahshua returns, that the first thing that's going to happen, or we know first thing's going to happen is the dead's going to rise, right, to meet Yahshua in the air. Then the living's going to be changed. This is based on 1 Corinthians 4. And when that happens, we're all going to be changed from flesh to spirit beings. And when that happens, we're going to be spirit, and we're not going to be flesh and blood, and we're going to be found worthy of that promise. So this entire process, this entire process of being born again occurs and is, and is initiated at baptism. And that's one reason why water baptism is so important, because without water baptism, we are not born of the water. And Scripture says if we're not born of the water, we are not born again. And if we're not born again, we cannot see Yahweh's kingdom and certainly the first resurrection. So again, it's a very pivotal point from a theological standpoint. So as believers and those searching for truth, water baptism is, is an essential part of what it is to be a believer. And in fact, it's really the only way we become part of the family. And uh, we see that all throughout scripture. Today, I am certainly pleased to, uh, to uh, say that we have a, a, a person that's come all the way, again from Long Island, New York, to uh, seek immersion into Yahshua's name and to really dedicate her life to Yahweh. And, on a personal note, I've uh, corresponded with uh, Judy for, I don't know, several years. It's been a long time, just off and on. So it is uh, just a great pleasure to have her here today and to see her willing to devote her life to Almighty Yahweh. So uh, Judy, if you'd like to come forward, Judy Stern, and I'm going to ask you four questions, as we've uh, already discussed in the baptismal counseling. Looking for a yes or an affirmative for each. So, number one, have you repented of your sins? Yes. Hallelujah. Number two, do you accept Yahshua as the Messiah, Savior, and ruler in your life, and do you now renounce Satan with his destructive ways and sinful pleasures of this world? Yes. Hallelujah. Do you enter this day into the new covenant with Yahweh through the name and blood of Yahshua to be faithful unto the end? Yes. Hallelujah. And lastly here is, are you willing to work with the brethren of Yahweh's assembly to aid all sincere seekers of truth to find a path to everlasting life? Hallelujah. Now, it is raining outside, or was raining. Normally, rain doesn't occur when we immerse, but it's uh, not the first time. So it may be the uh, larger group. Of course, we always encourage everybody to come out and witness the immersion. So we would, but we have a large overhang, as you all know, in the front there, and then also uh, the smaller building. So use the overhangs, and uh, we will dismiss for the moment service. We'll do the baptism, and we'll come back afterwards. service. So in Acts 8, uh, 14, Philip went to Samaria and preached the word. And as we see in this passage, many believed and uh, were immersed in Yahshua's name. Now, Philip, he is a deacon. So this is one reason why we believe that a deacon can immerse and uh, not necessarily lay hands on, uh, because we uh, find later after Samaria had received the word, in verse um, 14 of Acts 8, it says, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard the Samaria had received the word of Elohim, they sent unto them Peter and John. So we find that the apostles, which were also elders, by the way, Peter and John came down. It says, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for as yet he, uh, he or it was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized into the name of Yahshua, into the master Yahshua. So we uh, find here that, or verse 17 continues, it says, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the 
Holy Spirit. So, you know, baptism, not, not, every, not everybody understands this, by the way. Some people believe that baptism is simply the baptizo or the immersion. And yet baptism really has two components or two parts. We have the, the, the water baptism, the baptizo, the immersion, which is really the washing away of sins, and that's what we find. So one is for the cleansing portion, and the other part is for the receiving or the imparting of the Holy Spirit, which happens through the laying of hands and not necessarily through the baptizo or the uh, submersion. So that is why we here do both, the baptism followed by the laying on of hands. So at this point, if I can call a, and, and by the way, I kind of like this tra transition. Uh, you know, normally I'll say something like, you know, Judy or whatever. And, uh, but now it's Sister Judy. So you see, you see how that works? I think most of you understand that, but, but now Sister Judy is part of the family here and at the assembly. So uh, it's certainly a blessing to uh, see that. So if I can call forth a Sister Judy Stern for the uh, laying on of hands and also Elder Allen. All right, Father, we come for you at this time. We have witnessed a desire, Sister Judy, to come to you through the waters of baptism to overcome, repented of her sins, and now wants to serve you for the rest of her life. So we pray on my God that she look down upon her neck, grant her the Holy Spirit that might work within her life, that would give her the understanding and resolve and the ability to walk that narrow way that we all must walk. So that one day, Masha, when he returns, will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome into the life of our asking. We pray on Mighty Yahweh now that you'll be with her, bless her, help her to overcome any trials that the Hasatan might throw at her. She might then one day be raised. As a true servant of yours, to be with you in your kingdom forever, to serve you. This is her goal. This is our desire to I pray on my own about you. Bless her with that spirit. Guide her, strengthen her, and be with her and her family as she walks that way. Joshua has shown us, and he has given to us to do. So this prayer petition we ask now in Yasha's name. Amen. Well, as we normally do, we would encourage everybody after the service, we'll uh, form our receiving line right here, so we would encourage everybody to uh, welcome our new sister, uh, Judy, to the body of Messiah, to the family here in this ministry, and uh, again, it's such a blessing to see this, and, and um, Luke chapter 15, verse 10, it says, that likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels, and the angels of Elohim over one sinner that repents, and of course, we've had one sinner, and we've had one sinner to repent. And I'm sure there's a rejoicing right now in heaven. So uh, let's uh, certainly uh, keep Judy in prayer that she would continue on this path and that Yahweh's blessings would uh, be upon her and that she would always, always remember the commitment she made along with the commitment we've made uh, previously and that we would all be blessed to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. May Yahweh bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well. Welcome to Truly, Sister Judy. Would everyone please rise? I'd like to call forward the worship team, as well as Brother James will give us our closing prayer. Indeed so, Sister Judy, keep that, well, again with the song, as it said, holy love flowing in you and filling you up, even in your times and trials that will certainly come. Brother James. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day of celebration, for the new life. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. Father, may we get our eyes off ourselves and place our eyes upon you, and that we advance layer by layer to draw closer to you, Father, in understanding of your word and who we are in the Messiah. Father, a greater understanding of the authority that we have on the earth because we are in Messiah. Father, may we be more attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit and make ourselves available for the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Father, we just glorify you. And may we be as Peter prayed, Father, that we, that you give us great boldness, Father, to declare Yahshua HaMashiach to the nations, Father, and the opportunity to do so. 
Father, may we be instant in season and out of season. May we walk in the righteousness that is ours through the Messiah. Father, may we have that shalom, shalom, that perfect peace in all situations. And may the joy of our salvation arise and overflow us, Father. May we be faithful unto you and unto your word, Father. We exalt you and glorify you and just thank you for the many rich blessings that you've given unto us, Father. And we give you the praise in Yahshua's name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us read together. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Hallelujah. This concludes today's service. May you all remember that it is your destiny to be overcomers. We know that your time is valuable and we appreciate that you spent it with us today. We pray that you have a fantastic week and that the message and worship from today will help strengthen your walk and faith in the Messiah, Yahshua. Yahweh be with you and your family. May He guide you and keep you safe. Until we meet again, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.